Welcome to Fairfield Celebrity Theater. I'm Bob Link, and today we welcome back into town a former Fairfield resident, Fairfield High School and Miami University graduate. He performed on the stage locally here in his youth, and he's gone on to perform in television, film, and the theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Lang. Welcome to Celebrity Theater. Thank you, Bob. Eric, what inspired you to get into acting? Um... I, I don't know if I was, uh, well, I, when I was a kid, my mom kept this little diary of things I would do that was odd or interesting. And uh, from a really young age, I was imitating people a lot. Like at two and a half, she had written down that I was imitating John Wayne. and I always liked to do little readings when I put on a little suit and tie on a TV table and read for my parents in the living room. Um, it was once when I put on a gorilla suit and sat in the driveway, waved to passing cars. So there was some stimuli early on <laughs> to do it, but, um, but I didn't mess with it um, for the longest time. I, um, I would inquire when I was a kid um, and all the way through to middle school. And in middle school, I got into what's called show choir, mm -hmm. which is sequin vests and bow ties and jazz hands. And, and, uh, and I was in a show choir for three years and we would tour and compete and, and that was sort of my entertainment uh, fix. And um, then my freshman year in high school, uh, there was no show choir. We, had our, we were in our own school, the freshman school, because there were so many students. And a friend of mine, one of my best friends to this day, Nick Yort, um, said, I'm going to this meeting, the drama club. You know, do you want to come? And I thought, well, what the heck? And I did. And... Um, when I walked in there, I met all these people, these, this great group of the oddest, quirkiest, you know, eccentric folks, but who were so confident and, and who were so alive and, and uh, just amazing personalities. And I thought, boy, if this, if this thing gives these people this kind of life inside, I want to know what that's about. So I started uh, auditioning, and, and uh, that was the start of it. So you remember what your first production was? Absolutely. It was, uh, it was The Robber Bridegroom, and I wasn't even cast. It was an understudy. And um, with Nick, the man who introduced me to the whole thing, and uh, so I only went on a couple times. But, uh, but I remember distinctly uh, when that show closed, the first time I went on, and the little curtain came down. And the curtain came back up, and everyone was clapping, and I was sitting on stage, and I remember just distinctly hearing in my voice, you know, I'm home. This feels like home. And um, that's where I've stayed. The audience interaction. If so, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's the, that electricity of, of a theater and a story and an audience. and a, I, I don't know what it is. It just, it's electric to me, and I couldn't leave it. I think most people, when you're up on the stage... If it were me, and I looked out and I saw five, six, seven hundred people, mm -hmm. I would freeze. I would absolutely freeze because you can see their faces. Yeah. Do you watch the reaction you get when you're performing? Well, it depends on the theater. A lot of theaters, it's so dark you can't really see anybody, um, and it's impossible uh, if you're looking out not to sometimes see someone, maybe even sleeping, which is a little frustrating. <laughs> Of course, it never happens to me, but... Of course. Um, but no, you tend not to pay attention to that. I think the thing that people get confused or, or think would be frightening about it is, is like, to, for me to talk about me in front of 700 people would makes me quite nervous. But when you're playing a character, you sort of have that little shield you get to wear. You have, a, you have another costume, you know. So if anyone's judging you, it's not you, it's this other... Th you're just it's showing the them something. Yep. Yeah, like you can juggle or anything else, it's just... It's just a, a character you're showing, so sure. it tends to allow you to feel a little more comfortable. Was there any one person that inspired you to pursue? I mean, you mentioned Nick. Was right. there was there anybody that just jumps out besides Nick? That well, um, I would have to say uh, Jim and Pat Davis, yeah. who, who ran the drama department at, at uh, Fairfield, and and still are very active in, in theater in Fairfield. Um, they, and in addition to being very talented at what they do, and they're just great human beings. Yeah. And we're so supportive to all of us um, and, and made it just such fun. You know, it was really a great thing. So, and when I graduated, in fact, from high school, 
I was going to say my parents uh, as well, but I, I don't know that my parents were on board completely to, about this acting thing until I graduated high school and that they asked Jim and Pat, they said, you know, you might want to do this, what do you suggest? And they said, we don't often say kids should go into acting as a profession, but we think it'd be a good idea for Eric. Yeah. And they immediately were on board. You know, Eric, I remember the variety shows, <laughs> the, the performances that you gave there. Yeah. And there were a lot of good, talented kids. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was editing these, these programs, they were two and a half, three hours long. I would spend weeks in post-production and I always noticed there was a little something different when, when you gave a performance. It was just a little different, you could tell. So it, it didn't surprise me in the least that you jumped out there and went into acting, but your parents supported you too and that was, that was very nice. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's very hard to do without that, some kind of wall like that to lean on. Yeah. So, so it was actually in high school that you determined this is where you want to go? Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I guess I knew by the end of the four years, I knew I had some kind of knack for it, and I knew I really liked it. Now, then college was like, well, if I go and I do it in college, do I go to a school that just does that, or do I go to a school that's a more well-rounded school in case I get there and go, if I could even get in? I sort of did it step by step. I was sort of walking slowly into the pool. I thought, well, I liked it in high school. If I get into a college yep. to act, then maybe I'll do that. So I, I ended up going to Miami because I thought, well, if I get there and this training and everything's driving me crazy and I don't want to do this anymore, I could move to another major and I'd be supported there because it's, it's such a good school. Um, but I did. I auditioned around to a couple schools who just did acting and some that, that were more well-rounded and ended up going to Miami. And um, at that point, getting to Miami and then getting the feedback I got there, because high school, you think, well, it's a little pond, you know, maybe. Right. Um, maybe no one knows what they're talking about or whatever. But once I got to college, it sort of reinforced the experiences I had had in high school, and I thought I have to, I have to keep going. With this. Yeah. yeah. Looking back, what was your favorite high school memory? <sighs> My goodness. Well, those variety shows were something special, actually. Uh, I, I, it was just, I loved the community of it. I, you know, the theater thing, there was the theater crowd and then there were, you know, everybody else. But I loved that there were, there were the jocks and the geeks and the theater people and the band people. And everyone was in one sort of communal thing. Um, I also liked it because you got to see different sides of a lot of people that yeah. you've never seen before. It was so, sort of, pick whatever you want to do. I yeah. loved that about it. And I guess senior year, the big thing that we do when we, the whole class gets on the stage and sings. Right. It's, it's a powerful little memory. Yeah. Um, but in terms of shows, I would, I guess, gosh, the music man, I think that was, Harold Hill, a, you don't get to do that too often. Yeah, so. music man was big. That was a fun. It was a huge, huge success. Yeah, that was a fun show. Um, so I love that. But every little play we did in that little tiny black box, I point like it's there. I, the, the, the first time in this month. This, yes, yeah, nice theater. Gorgeous and, theater. And, Tell the viewers what it was like at the old high school. I mean, this is phenomenal to yeah. have this. Yeah, this is like uh, Broadway. But well, we, we were in um, Parish Auditorium was the was the variety shows. Right. Do we do the musicals there too? I don't. I think. Yeah. Uh, I think there were a few that a were couple, done there. But we also used the gym. Yes. I'm asking you because I literally don't. Yes. Yes. Remember no. it all. But yeah, we were. Gosh, we were in a gymnasium. You know, for the, those a few of those musicals with an orchestra with the acoustics going yeah, all over the walls and people in folding chairs, as I remember it. And, uh, Paris I actually kind of liked as a theater. I thought that was kind of an, an okay place to be. It actually had a pit, I remember. Right. An orchestra pit. And then we had the little black box in the high school, which was just, you know, sort of tucked next to the lockers for the band people, I think, or something, as I remember. And... Uh, we had a little wall of fame, you know, with all our pictures as we went down the hallway. But it was literally 20 or 30 seats or something like that. Yeah. We still have a wall of fame. It's oh. Out, yeah, it's out behind us, behind me. I have to go it's, check yeah, it out. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of photos, people that, um, Fairfield students and others. Um, I know I've seen your picture, but I don't think it's out there. I think it's up in Mr. and Mrs. D's little corner oh, uh, of sweet. the world. And uh, sweet. Yeah, I've seen that up there a couple of times. and. Oh. often wondered how you were doing, and then I turn on the TV. There you are. Ah, yep. you know. Doing well. What, um, 
teachers what in high school and college what teachers gave you you know the feel that you knew what you were when you mentioned Jim and Pat mm -hmm. um, college level and high school level what were the, was there anybody else um, boy Jim and Jim and Pat for sure you know just in terms of like always going back to your safe little your parents if they were if I had theater parents they would probably be it and uh, you know, Diane Robinson, yeah. for sure, for the variety shows, absolutely. Just been making it really some fun and giving me so many opportunities, you know. Um, in college, uh, oh gosh, um, Janice Dean was my first studio professor where we were in. We had studio, which was about eight hours a day of just training and voice and movement and, uh, you know, dialects and the whole nine yards. But Jan Dean was sort of our our main professor, and she was so uh, hard on us in a great, great way, and she didn't let a lot slip, and I, I think we were very lucky to have her. She was actually going to leave Miami and stayed to finish my senior year, Nice, um, which I'm grateful for. Uh, Stan Brown is another who I'm still friends with today. He's just a great mentor to me about life, uh, in addition to, to his abilities as a, as a, as a teacher. He's an amazing man. Uh, Rosalind Benson. Um, um, who else? My goodness. Uh, Mike Griffiths. I mean, there were so many people. Uh, Martin Benson. Uh, is, um, gosh, there were a lot of folks at Miami that I... It's such formative years, you know, that I look back on that all guided in one way or another. But those are the names that, that pop out off yeah. the bat. I'm not sure how they, being Mr. and Mrs. D, Mrs. Robinson, put up with the cast that they had to put up with. <laughs> you kids were all a handful. Oh a gosh. lot of kids involved. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned before the jocks were on the stage, oh, yeah. the theater people, the, the musicians. We had, it was pretty well-rounded. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure how they, they put up with they, all of that. They but, deserve a special spot, you know, in, in heaven. They, they are saints, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Was there ever a time when you said to yourself, I just can't do this? Yes. Um, and it, uh, uh, Yeah. You know, it wasn't early on, I think. Early on, you're, you're sort of training and you're so, you're so blinded by all that and, and you got your eye on the prize and you don't know how hard it's going to be or what might happen. But there was a couple years. Uh, I moved to Los Angeles three months after graduating from Miami. Packed everything I owned into a little red eclipse, um, waved to my parents and hit the road. And uh, uh, the first six months there was a little just excitement about living in a new place, trying to learn the freeways, trying not to get mugged, you know, whatever you want, want to call it. And then um, I got into commercials pretty quickly and I was doing some commercials. And that was okay, but they were sort of here and there. And I just remember thinking, um, and I've done this two or three times out there, I just don't know, I just don't. This is, is it going to be this way the rest of my life? Am I just going to be, you know? And I actually started looking at about three years in there, I think it was, at working in advertising or what else would I do? You know, if it's going to be this hard, what else? Because I've never considered anything else. I've always been an actor. And as soon as I did that, I got a job. And I started to think, maybe I should do that more often. There's two ways you get a job. You start thinking you want to quit because it will always suck you back in. Or you buy a plane ticket, because whenever I buy a plane ticket, there's a job right on the day I'm supposed to fly out. So, but yeah, it, you know, you start to go, well, should I, but it's been so long now. I've been there 13 years, and this is still all I've ever done. And I've made a living that way for, for almost 10 years now, yep. you know, with no other side job. So I'm very lucky. Yep. And I remember when you, you came back home for a visit. You stopped by my office. You showed me some of the commercials. Yeah. I was impressed. Um, you even had a, um, a little two-week stint on The Bold and Beautiful. So popular. Yeah, I did a couple, couple episodes of The Bold and Beautiful. And uh, um, I think that was, yeah, I didn't have an agent then or anything. It was just a casting director who had seen me in a play. Because um, I was doing a lot of theater there at first as well. But yeah, commercials were my bread and butter for yeah. seven years. Commercials, which which ones? What were oh they? gosh, let's see. Uh, well, there's uh, Bud Light. Yep. My, that was a big one. That was one. Uh, the first season of Survivor 
uh, Bud Light. I had, it was a commercial of me and this other guy on a raft, um, and it ran every survivor. Um, and that we shot in Hawaii, which was a lot of fun. Um, Morgan Stanley, you know those ads that they would say, I'm not her dad, I'm the Morgan Stanley guy. Yep. I was the first Morgan Stanley guy. Um, I was the first uh, Net Zero commercial. Yep. I was a spokesperson for them. I was a spokesperson for Northwest Airlines for a little while. Jack in the Box, Sears, Chevrolet, Saturn, uh, Hyundai. I mean, just commercials. Jack in the Box is the burger place. Jack in the Box is a out, local out burger west, place. Exactly. Yes, yeah. Yeah. We don't have the Jack in the Box here, but right. so they know. Right. It's, it's the uh, the little drive through burger place yes. out west. Yes. How do you prepare for a role? Gosh, um, I don't know. I feel like all the training you do um, gives you a different tool belts to wear or different tools in your belt to use. And, um, and I'm one of those guys that likes to, to, I don't go by one method or one anything. I kind of like to pick and choose from here to there and there. And the more you do it, the more you sort of recognize things you have within you that you can bring out or accents or whatever. Um, experiences surely help. But I think the first thing is just reading it quite a bit um, and getting as many clues as you can from the script. And then the, the next thing I do is, it, without even trying to, usually is I, I get focused on the outside. Um, like shoes and clothes and things are a big deal for me at auditions because I, it just helps me convince myself, you know. Become the character. Exactly, to become the character. I, I like that visual for some reason. I think I was always a visual learner. So I like the outside. I just like the feel of things. I like, I mean, I'll grow facial hair. Uh, uh, home, what little hair I have left differently. Um, glasses are a big thing for me, I love those. So once I get that on, um, then I feel a bit safer to play around with the, the guts of the person. And, um, and then uh, knowing your lines really well helps, yeah. <laughs> which is a task sometimes. Uh, it so. would be difficult to learn, I mean, if, especially for theater. Mm -hmm. You screw up, it's out there. Right. With television and film both unless it's a live program, mm -hmm. you can go back and patch things up. Right. But with the live theater, what do you do when you forget your lines? ad -lib? Well, it, it, it's only happened to me a couple times, thankfully. Because theater, you get to rehearse for, right. you rehearse about a month. And then by that time, I'm usually pretty, pretty sailing. And in fact, the only two times it's happened to me were very late in the run. When you are under the illusion, you know everything. And um, it was a musical which is even worse because not only can you not just say any line, but it has to be in rhythm and on note with something else that you're forgetting. And it was three guys in a row, and there were, we each had a verse. And I remember stepping up and going, okay, we're all doing the thing, and the first guy goes, and I'm, I'm thinking, I don't think I know. I don't think I know my thing. What is, what is my thing? And the next guy goes, and I'm like, I, 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 and I thought, let's just, I'm just going to let it go, and I'm sure it'll come out of my mouth. And I went, Funny, funny, can I punish, funny? Uh, that's exactly what I said. I, it, and it's on tape. You know, it was one of the two nights they taped the show, and so I looked like an idiot, but it, is, it was fun. And it, it really doesn't happen that often. Um, the funny thing about TV film is that, uh, yeah, you can go back and retape, but you really don't want to be screwing up your lines if you're, you know, a guest star or whatever. You know, it, it just doesn't look good. Um, but also, you'll do it so many times that it doesn't make sense anymore. If it's a complicated speech, I had a speech on JAG once about some stealth plane, the DOD and the high tech, but you know. And when you say those words that you don't even quite understand uh, enough, it's like Bill Cosby used to say, obey. If you say obey enough times, it doesn't make sense. So you have to really, you have to really concentrate to, to keep that language fresh and, and uh, cause otherwise you can just get, you know, you lose the meaning of it, and then you start forgetting it because yeah. you don't know what you're saying. LAX. Yeah. You played the role of a doctor. Mm -hmm. When you're out there in front of the camera, you've got these lines. There's, I don't know if the people realize this or not, but there's places where they will, if you really lose your place, they'll put your script for you out in, in places where you're looking, but it's off camera. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that helps some actors right. get through it. 
Have they done that with you? No, I've never gotten to do that. Good for you. Sometimes they put them on legal pads or whatever, yeah. or they'll just write them out. Um, and in fact, I got, you know, um, I did a Boston Legal episode just a couple months ago. And there was this line that said, if you'll refer to the contract. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, I'll whip out a contract and I'll read this next line, which was a bunch of legalese in the event of a, a material processing complication, life job, blah, 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 whatever the thing was. And I get there and I said, so where's my contract I'm going to, because I was just going to, sometimes the prop guy will actually, the, the contract will look very authentic. So I figured, oh, the line will be right there. And I, I memorized it anyway, but I was sort of hoping I could lean on that. And I got there and I said, where's my uh, contract thing? He goes, oh, you don't need that. This guy's got it memorized. He does it all the time. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. I do have it memorized, but doggone it, I wanted to cheat. You yeah, know? yeah. Sometimes you want to cheat. But Eric, you've got a pretty extensive list of accomplishments, and I'm just going to read. These are from the trademark, uh, trademarktalent.com, which is your agent. Um, we're going to read a few of these so the folks at home know what they've, what you, what your accomplishments sure. are. Um, in television, you've got Boston Legal, which you mentioned, Journeyman, Entourage, Burn Notice, ER, Cold Case, Ghost Whisper, CSI New York, The West Wing, Without a Trace, CSI, The Perverts, NCIS, Judging Amy, JAG, LAX, The Shield, McBride, The Bernie Mac Show, All of Us, Wanda at Large, Oliver Bean. With film, you move on into Killer Moves, Mr. Woodcock, Brutal, Bondage, AM 1200, Paul is Dead, The Inside Track. Is it Roner? It is. Roner? We'll leave this one off. Nostradamus. <laughs> We're on local cable. We won't say that one. <laughs> um, and in the theater, um, you're pretty active. Uh, the Rubicon Theater, which I think a lot of people will recognize. Driving Miss Daisy, a Streetcar Named Desire, Empire State. Asylum, Ugly's First World, Arsenic and Old Lace, Blues Brothers, two thousand seventy dollars to a bus ride home, the Cactus Complex, the uh, Scottish Play, the Normal Heart, the American Clock, the Foreigner, Romeo Juliet, Assassins, Burn This, and additional material. You've done a few little music videos, and folks, you can see the excerpts of these if you visit the trademark.com website trademarktalent.com trademark talent. that's my manager not my agent that's your Just manager yeah. okay manager trademarktalent.com you can go there and see um, some of eric's work and um, it's quite an extensive list um, how did you like universal studios hollywood the, the theater how did you land jobs like that that was uh I, when I first moved to L.A., I knew I needed to get some kind of day job. And uh, so, but I was trying to think of a job that would have some sort of acting bias. And uh, I auditioned to become a tour guide on their little trams that go through the, the studios, which was quite an intensive little process. But I got hired, and so I was a tour guide for six months there. Um, and uh, after that, I started doing commercials. And then... A little ways down the road, they had auditions for the Blues Brothers, their stage show in the park. And so I auditioned for that and ended up being, they have five teams of people. But I was on one of those teams um, to play uh, the Dan Aykroyd role in the, uh, the Blues Brothers, which was a lot of fun. We, we toured around, we did parades, we would do meet and greets, and then the work in the, in the uh, park, which was great because if you had an audition, you could, another guy could replace you, um, pay was great. It was a good group of people. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Rubicon Theater. How how did you end up there? Rubicon Theater. Um, a guy I had met. I, I say everything I've gotten in L.A. has come from theater. Every single thing. Every agent I've gotten came as a recommendation from an actor I met doing a play. Every. Um, it just you can trace everything back to a play. And this is another example of that. A, a guy I met in a play, Brian McDonald, um, started working for them in a managerial. Uh, sense, and he had been for quite a while, and I never auditioned there. And then they were doing Streetcar Named Desire, and he said, "I think you would make a great Mitch." So I went up and auditioned, and I got Mitch, and I did Mitch uh, opposite Linda Pearl. Um, I don't know if you know, but who's an amazing mm -hmm. actress, and uh, 
So that was my sort of first, and that was my first equity job. That got me the stage actors union is ac actors equity. Right. So that got me my equity card, and um, I just fell in love with the place. It's in Ventura, so it's not in LA. It's like 45 minutes out, but you can still make it back to an audition if you have one. And the people there, it's a small town, you know, and the people there are just the most lovely, warm. You know, they're just like another Jim and Pat Davis. And, yep. And um, we just formed this great relationship. And so ever since then, uh, they've been throwing other stuff my way. So I do about a, a show a summer there. Be, summer being the time it's slowest in TV film because right. I can't really do that, do both anymore. But yeah, I'll do a, 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 about a play a summer. And it's just a fantastic... You don't get to use those muscles in film and TV. So it's a great outlet to to keep my theater roots alive sure. out there, you know. I think a lot of actors do that. I don't know if people realize that or not, but um, it's just uh, a lot of theater in the L.A. area, and it's not just in the Hollywood, it's all over. Mm -hmm. And uh, same as in New York. I know some people kind of jog back and forth between the two just to get back to the, their roots, which is the theater. Yeah, it's just a completely different animal, and, and, um, and I like doing I've done it in L.A. a bunch too, but I like doing it in Ventura because it's, there's a lot of... Uh, people doing theater in L.A. hoping to get an agent or hoping to be on a TV show or whatever. And the folks doing it in Ventura, and that's fine, I did that too, but the folks in Ventura are really doing it just to make good theater. Yep. Um, they're, not, they're not there to try and, you know. But we've had great people. Or Jack Lemmon, the last time he was on stage was at the Rubicon. Um, a lot of amazing, uh, amazing names have crossed that, yeah. those boards. So. What, um, what do you enjoy the most? Television, movies, or the theater? Boy, they all have their pluses. Um, I mean, theater's great because it's a direct connection with an audience, and, and you get to do the whole thing at once, which is nice. Um, television is nice because it's, uh, it's regular. You know, if you're on a series, you, have, you work a certain amount of weeks, and then you're off for the summer, and then you're back. Um, but it can be really, really long days. Yes. And... Um, and fairly methodical too. Some of those shows are that I've been on are like machines. You know, you sort of walk in, they're like, "Okay, you're going to be here." We're going to, and they know exactly how they shoot every episode. And there's something sort of, I don't know, uh, that can be kind of dry. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know how to put it. I don't want it to sound like it's a bad experience. It's just, um, it can be a rather uh, a less creative experience. Yeah. Um, movies are great. Um, Movies are great because uh, a lot of the time in television, you know, you're locked into if it's an hour show, 42 minutes of content, which means if you had some sort of thought you were having that took a little too long in editing, they can just snip that off. And it sort of, it can rob some of your performance from you, which I'm opposed to. Um, but um, in movies, it's the length of the film, you know, whatever it is. So it, it just, you can... You can do more with the content. You're not obligated to, you know, only say certain words because it's television. Or it's just a. I think it's a great, highly creative, uh, a little more free zone to work in. Any plays you've done that have gone on to become a movie? Uh, yes, there is a great crossover there. Um, a play. I did a reading of a play called Mating Dance of the Werewolf. Um, written by a great playwright named Mark Stein at the Rubicon. And it went and became a production um, that started in Canada and then moved to... The, the Rubicon has a partnership with the theater in Canada, uh, the Manitoba Theater Center. So they share a lot of shows. Um, and it became a production, and I was not in the production because of this various, various reasons. But um, then a year or two later, uh, Kate Kaplan... Uh, wrote a screenplay version of the play, and um, I got to do Alan, the character I read in the reading, who I loved so much, great character, in the movie. Um, and we just wrapped that like, I don't know, four or five months ago. And that's uh, the Killer Moves uh, movie, which may be being renamed, I'm not quite sure. But ho So hopefully that'll be out soon. But it's great when those two worlds collide. That's a lot of fun. What's the audition process like? The audition process is uh, every day there's something that goes out to all agents and managers called the breakdowns. 
and it has a listing of every show and what roles that show needs for that week, or movies, or documentaries, a- anything. Everything and everything is on there. So my manager will look through that, and he'll decide, I'm right for this, this, and this, submit the headshots, and then hopefully we get a phone call. And of course, there are probably 3,000 headshots going in for any given role. So just to get an audition, where they see, I don't know, they might see 30, 100 people, is a tremendous achievement already. Um, and then they'll call in about, I don't know, 150, 20, it depends on the casting director, to be seen. Um, and early on, you'll just be called in to read for the casting director. And then um, they'll have what's called a producer call, where the producers, the writers, the director, whatever, will be in the room. And you read for them, and then you get the part, hopefully. But the, the process of, of auditioning is pretty, pretty, it's the most anti-theatrical thing uh, I, I can imagine. You're usually in an office, and there's a desk there and a bookcase and fluorescent lighting, and you get a chair and you're holding your sides, which is what they call a script. And, and you're just sort of, you know, reading with a casting director who may or may not be reading with much enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, but it's a very uh, undramatic well, I, would, I would think it'd be a little intimidating, too. You're not actually in a theater setting. No. You're just walking into the office and become this character. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like an, I mean, it's just very, it's fluorescent lighting and, and a desk and a chair, and, and everyone sort of tends to sit there like this and watch you. <laughs> you know, they've had a long day, and, and uh, so it can be rather, it can be rather intimidating. Yeah. yeah. What um, do you lean towards more, the dramas, the comedies? Um, I always thought I would be doing sitcoms. I always thought that's where I would, my thing would be. Um, but what's funny is I've done very few of the sitcoms. Um, I uh, Mainly, that list you'll see is mainly one-hour dramas. In fact, we joke there's, we're going to have to start making new shows because I've almost every one-hour drama on CBS I've done. So those tend to be the things I end up doing. For some reason, someone thinks I look harmless enough in an average way that would make me an interesting person to harm other people. I mean, you always see a serial killer or whoever uh, on the news, and everyone goes, it looks like my, my neighbor. Right, right. So with this mug, apparently, that's a lot of the roles I get are these rather devious guys. You play a pretty convincing... Murder. We've oh man, yeah, we're in the, we're in the gamut. <laughs> yeah, cold case I, comes to mind. You were um, uh, actually a pretty, pretty good size role for you too. It was a great role. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I, one of my favorite shows. But I, I think it's interesting. A lot of times, if you look at television, you'll see where the characters that come in in small parts here and there come back as a major character further on down the line. It could be a year, two years. A lot of times, you, I, I see it a lot in Law and Order, you'll see a lot of the people that right. come in and play a small part come back to take on a major part. Um, right. And that, that's got to be a little encouraging, too, to, um, to know that they are looking at your accomplishments. Yeah, that would be fun. Mm-hmm. What, um, what are you working on right now? What's your current project? Right now, um, I just got, I did a reading um, of a pilot about six months ago. And um, six months later, uh, well, well, again, it goes back to theater. Um, a friend of mine is, is James Denton, who's the plumber on Desperate Housewives. Yep. And uh, one of the nicest guys on the planet. And he asked me to do this reading. He was reading the lead of, and I was reading his best friend. It was called The Renegades. Uh-huh. And it was about a band uh, that was together, like in high school and college with these guys. And um, one of the guys gets married to my sister, the best friend's sister. And that sort of causes ruffles, and the the band breaks up for various reasons. And the the lead guy goes the corporate route and um, and leads the married life and has kids. And then my character, the best friend, goes off the other way and moves to an island and uh, starts drinking banana daiquiris and and, uh, living the high life. develops an internet scam that makes him millions of dollars. So I have no job, I have a Gulf Stream and a boat. And then the corporate guy, the married guy, uh, gets divorced. And I see it as an opportunity to reel him into the island lifestyle and to 
get this band back together. And, and it's a very sweet little little show. Um, so they, six months later, after doing the reading of the pilot, called and said, we want to make six episodes. So it's being independently produced. And um, we're shooting in South Carolina for two months and Catalina for a little while. And, and uh, at the end of six episodes, they're going to shop it around the networks and see where it might land. So it's very exciting. Yep. Hopefully the network will pick it up. Absolutely. Become a regular series, which is a nice achievement for you. Absolutely. Um, and yep. you've got second lead? Yeah, it's a, well, it's a, it's a good ensemble show, but the two main characters are, uh, are Jack and, and his family and then the, the best friend ship that we have. Yeah. yeah. So it's a nice, nice opportunity. Yeah, good. Good luck with that. That's what the beard yeah. and the, yeah. the hair is for. So. Stay in the, the character. Yeah, trying to yeah. get there by March. Back to the TV shows again. What's, what's your favorite TV show? Oh, gosh. Well, uh, favorite... Favorite accomplishment, I think, would be ER. Because when I first moved to LA, I lived in Burbank, um, and I would drive by Warner Brothers all the time. There's a stoplight right there. And when you look up from the stoplight at Warner Brothers, they have all their posters of their shows on the, right. on the studio. And at that time, it was 1995, 96, ER was the number one show on the planet. And that poster was always right there, and I would look up at that poster and think, gosh, if I could do anything on that show. And I had done extra work very early on in my career there, and, and I was an extra on ER. And I was so excited. I thought, oh my gosh. And I, I remember taking home one of the surgical gloves I wore, and shh, I didn't steal, though. I didn't steal. <laughs> um, and, and I just left the day feeling just high as a kite, and I thought, boy, if I could just, just say a line, if I could just, you know. And eight years later, um, I got an audition for a guest star on ER, and and I got it. And to, to, it was a, a dad fighting for his child, so it was the perfect kind of role. Yeah. So as far as arc goes, it was a nice little way to see progress, you know, and to see that I'd gone somewhere. But my fa my favorite, that's probably one of my favorites, actually. Um, Cold Case is probably one of the best roles I've had on television. Um, that was just a fun, fun character. And again, a, a show about a community theater doing a production of Cabaret, which I did in college. Yep. Which I played the MC, which was a blast. Um, so it's a, it, that was just a, a sort of a fun, another collision of theater and TV. But. Yeah. The Warner Brothers, it's pretty impressive. You go through, I mean, they'll, they'll even take you on a, um, a tour through. You can go through the set of ER, you get to see the setup. Um, everything's so small. Everything, yeah. it's, it's incredible when you walk through yeah. some of the sets, how actually they're so much smaller. They look so much larger. And, in uh, real life, they uh, are on TV, and, and they, it just has a way of looking larger. Yeah. They've, um, they shoot that on film, mm -hmm. and uh, not a lot of room for mistakes there, but uh, an yeah, exciting that, show. I think that's a that's pretty, uh, pretty big accomplishment, too, Eric. Yeah, the, the fun thing about that set is it's all one giant thing. When you walk in the soundstage, the set goes all the way to the other side of the soundstage. It's all connected. Yep. Some shows, you know, you, you have a room here and then you have craft services right behind it where all the food is and, you know, chairs and everything. But so once you walk in that world, you, you really feel like you're there. For, but it is always a little more, always a little underwhelming yeah. to see, you know. Yeah. Um, what would you say to anyone out there now that is considering I think I want to be in television. I think I want to be in theater. What would you What would you say to them? Oh boy, um, I would just say, do it as much as you possibly can, because that's that's what gave me a great leg up. I think I got to do a lot of plays in high school, and I I did everything I could. You know, readings for uh, plays in my living room. You know, uh, we would make little movies. Uh, my friends and I, when we were kids. Um, it was just all about exercising the imagination and exercising your little tool belt. And then in college, I got to do so many plays. Luckily, that, that when I got to LA, I, I really felt like I'd had some experience. Um, because once you get you know, somewhere and you get in those rooms and you're auditioning for things, you, really, you want to have your, your stuff together. You, know? you want to be as prepared as you can. Um, which is the other thing I would recommend is, is if you find through doing it a bunch, you, you love it, then they go get some training, you know, go study, take a class, or if you don't want to major in it or whatever, but uh, get in some kind of class that, yeah. that will allow you to, to get better and better. 
If there's uh, even Fairfield, we've got the community theater. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they have their day jobs. Yeah. Just to that release. Yeah. They have the community theater. And uh, for a lot of people, that's enough. But there's other people that aspire mm -hmm. to go just a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And that's why we brought you in here today wow. to give a little encouragement to the folks out there watching this in uh, Fairfield, Ohio. Sure. And uh, Eric, appreciate the time. Thank you for coming. Thank and, you so much uh, for sitting having down me. chatting with us. Good luck in your career. Um, folks at home, you can go to the website, trademarktalent.com, mm -hmm. check out some of Eric's work. Um, I, I think I, it's fascinating, some of the little clips they have on there. So give it a visit. And Eric, again, thank you. Good luck in your career. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you on TV. Appreciate it.